Okay, it's 8.01. I'm going to get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Vaughn. I'm a director here at Trepepe Smith, and we have the distinct honor of working with the town of Atherton on their housing element and making sure the community is up to date and involved in the whole process. So thank you for your participation and engagement. Um, we're going to get started here tonight, but before we do, I want to hand it over to the city manager, George Rodericks, to give some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to all of you that are joining us. Uh, for some of you uh, that may have been attending the multitude of housing related meetings with the town, tonight's going to be a bit of a repeat, but at a very high level, uh, not the granularity of some of those other meetings. For the rest of you, uh, this is an opportunity to get an overview of the status of the town's housing element and a few more details related to it. Plus, after the brief overview presentation by Jennifer, we have our planning team here to answer questions about the status of the housing element, multifamily housing, and the state requirements that the town is facing. Tonight's an opportunity to learn more about the housing element and its current status on its path to compliance and offer some feedback. So we look forward to your participation in the workshop. As you know, the town's general plan is one that is largely made up of one acre single family zoning. And throughout the six cycle housing element process, the council has heard from residents in support of that vision remaining the same. However, the state, as you know, doesn't really see it that way. And the legislature through and including the governor's office has put forward hundreds of new pieces of legislation over the last five years, six years or so that impose requirements that are gonna change that vision. And while the town can largely remain with its one acre single family zoning, new state laws require the town to adopt changes to local zoning that provide opportunity for subdivision of those one acre parcels, more commonly known as SB9, changes that allow for the creation and placement of more accessory dwelling units, and changes that provide opportunities for the development of multifamily housing. This is state law. And while the council is choosing a path of compliance, we're also trying to identify a path of compliance that ensures a close compatibility with the underlying community vision. Even through the provision of multifamily development opportunity sites, the town is developing objective design standards that will help shape the look and feel of those developments if they occur so that they may maintain existing community design characteristics. And we need your input on this. And the next opportunity to do that is on November 13th at community workshop number two. There's an online survey available also via the town's website on accessory dwelling units. And if you have an ADU or are interested in renting one uh, or interested in building one and renting one, we'd love to know about that as it'll help us as we report our compliance to the state. We know you have some questions around these issues and these questions are valuable and we wanna hear them. And we want to, we are here tonight to provide the answers that we can and to hear your thoughts. So again, thank you for being here and I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Thank you, George. Um, Jake, if we can go to the next slide, I just want to remind everyone in case you missed it when you logged in, we are recording tonight's meeting uh, so that it can be viewed at your discretion anytime later in case you miss something or you just love watching what's happening in the town of Atherton, you can watch it anytime you want. Um, it will be available on the city's website to watch anytime along with all the other materials uh, surrounding the housing element. Uh, next slide, great, thank you. Uh, tonight's agenda is going to be covered, um, as George mentioned, I know there's been plenty of other opportunities to learn about the housing element. So tonight we have one hour. Um, we've already gone through the welcome uh, introduction. You heard from two of us, you're gonna hear a little bit more. I'll show you who our panelists are tonight. They're going to be taking your Q and A's, um, but we'll go through a quick background, why we need a housing element, the components of a housing element, Atherton's housing element update of what's happened thus far, and then some more specifics about multifamily housing and ADUs and Atherton's housing element, and the next steps for the housing policy before we lead to the Q&As. We also have some next steps outlined for you as well. Next slide. So uh, many of you have had the opportunity to submit questions to the email listed on the slide here. Uh, we also have the opportunity to, during tonight's meeting to use the chat box Q&A icon to type in your question. If for some reason we are not able to get to all the questions tonight, we will follow up 
and be able to post that information on the website. So please uh, don't hesitate to submit any and all of your questions and don't fear that if they, it is not addressed tonight, it won't be ignored, it will be addressed at some point. And we encourage you to continue going back on the website for those updates. Next slide. So tonight's panelists, you already heard from the city manager, George Rodericks. We also have Andreas Boer, the deputy city attorney available, Jeff Bradley, the president of M Group, and Brittany Bendix, the town planner, also with M Group, to answer more of the specific planning questions that we'll have. So the background, in case uh, you weren't already aware, um, Atherton, as George mentioned, is made up of one acre zoning parcels, and that's part of the history of the town. It's not changing by including the multifamily housing, just we're simply abiding by the state law. We care immensely about the following, the regulations in the spirit of compliance, but we're also looking forward to hearing what your input is on how we balance those two uh, issues. Next slide. So why we need a housing element. Since 1969, California law requires that all local governments adequately plan to meet the housing needs of everyone in the community. And local governments meet this requirement by adopting housing plans as part of their general plan. The housing plan is known as a housing element. General plans serve as the local government's blueprint for how a city, town, or county will grow and develop. And California's housing element law requires local governments to adopt plans and regulatory systems that provide opportunities for housing development. So builder's remedy is a legal process that's used to facilitate the construction of low or middle income housing when a, munis a municipality fails to adopt a housing element in substantial compliance with state housing laws. Without an HCD certified housing element, the town is susceptible to developer proposals for builders remedy projects in Atherton and will have, oh, in Atherton will have little recourse to halt these projects. You may have seen some news articles about this recently in surrounding communities and throughout the state uh, where uh, cities have not been able to enforce their own zoning codes because of builders remedy. Next slide. So the components of a housing element, there are typically six. The first is a housing needs assessment. It examines demographic employment and housing trends and conditions that affect the community's housing needs. Second, evaluation of past performance, reviewing the prior housing element to measure progress in implementing policies and programs. Third, housing sites inventory, identifying locations of available sites for housing development or redevelopment to ensure that there's adequate capacity to address the regional housing needs allocation, also called RENA. So if you hear that, that's what it's in reference to. Um, those identified housing needs. Fourth, community outreach and engagement as what's taking place this evening. It's implementing a robust community outreach and engagement program with a particular focus on outreach to tradi traditionally underrepresented groups. So for instance, uh, October 23rd, there was already a community workshop on the town's objective design standards. And November 1st, there was the joint study session on the town's objective design standards. You have tonight's program and another one that's happening next week. Um, the fifth component of a housing element typically is constraints analysis, where you analyze and recommend remedies for existing and potential governmental and non-governmental barriers to housing development. And finally, policies and programs establishing policies and programs to fulfill the identified housing needs. So Atherton's housing element update, here's uh, in case you've missed some of the steps that, along the way. The first is the housing element was approved by the city council and submitted to the Department of Housing and Community Development, also known as HCD in January of 2023. Since then, the town has been working closely with HCD officials to ensure compliance with the state mandated requirements. Key sections of the housing element have already been adjusted to address their concerns. And the next issue we're tackling is identifying the sites for more multifamily housing developments 
including allowing some multifamily housing on private lots in Atherton. HCD has instructed staff that Atherton must include multifamily housing opportunities open to the broader public to produce a six cycle housing element compliant with requirements related to affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFFH, which combats discrimination and lifts barriers that restrict access to housing. The city council is considering an inclusionary housing ordinance and we welcome your input on that. The town is committed to a compliant housing element that complies with AFFH. The point that we want to emphasize is the town needs to identify enough multifamily sites in its housing element revisions to receive certification from HCD. Otherwise, we will not be in compliance and the process will continue while the town is open to the possibility of losing our local control over land use. That's the builder's remedy we mentioned earlier. So the issue at hand is not about the number of housing units the town needs to provide. The town's current plan already meets the required numbers through various means, including the ADUs mentioned, the accessory dwelling units, SB9 units, new single family development and housing on school sites. The state is requiring the town to permit multifamily housing open to the general public. Adopting an inclusionary housing ordinance is one way to show our commitment to meeting all the state's housing requirements. The town is a good actor in complying with state law, but will work to preserve the town's character while also meeting HCD's requirements. So uh, George mentioned earlier the accessory dwelling units and uh, the town is proposing that by adding ADUs, we can create more affordable housing opportunities. So you can visit the website, which the QR code um, links to that, where you can complete a survey and register your ADU and help Atherton meet its housing requirements. So some of the next steps, engaging with the community, as we mentioned before, but there's been several opportunities to learn about the housing element, but we're not stopping now. Uh, we're hosting a series of community events and discussions actively to engage actively with our residents and foster inclusivity and ensure everyone's heard. So the next one will be next week, November 13th. It's a second workshop on the town's objective design standards. We encourage you to participate in that as well. We're still liaising with HCD. We have ongoing collaboration with them to help us work towards compliance with the state law. And finally, we are working on proposing the ho housing element. So we'll continue to refine and finalize that, incorporating your feedback and addressing the state's requirements. So that was very fast. I know I went through a lot of information. Hopefully though, none of that was new to you that you've been following along as we've been doing these different opportunities for um, community engagement. And we encourage you to submit your questions if you haven't already. We did get a few ahead of time. So I will start with those. And uh, you'll notice here on your screen, I think you might only be able to see me when we have the questions as they come through, each of the panelists will be, be featured on the screen so you can see who our experts are to be able to help you. And the first one I have is for Brittany. The question is, is the town just trying to keep below market rate housing out of the town? Uh, so no, actually, um, can everybody hear me? Yes, great. So no, the town is pursuing affordable housing as a good actor. Uh, we're meeting the requirements of the regional housing needs allocation or RENA requirement. Um, what we're focusing now is how to be more inclusive through the multifamily housing typology that the state is asking us to meet for AFFH, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. Uh, okay, let me get to the next question. Has the town, and this one is probably directed towards our Deputy City Attorney, Andreas, has the town considered a legal case against the state on this issue, 
or have cities looked at banding together to reassert a more fair balance between state and local decisions on housing? We have looked at that, and so far nobody who's tried that has been successful, and so we really don't see that as a viable alternative to just adopting a compliant housing element. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Brittany. How does infrastructure like sewer, power, water impact things like building high-density multi-unit housing on a single lot in the middle of a neighborhood? So the sites that we're looking at relative to multifamily, um, but also the entire housing element sites um, have all been evaluated, to, evaluated relative to their proximity related to major transit corridors, access to resources such as schools, um, commercial facilities, recreational facilities. Uh, so part of that also includes sewer and water, and that's just a regular component of what is uh, incorporated into the housing element process. Great, thank you. Um, and then this one is for Brittany or George, um, depending on who wants to take it. What are the town's next steps towards achieving compliance with the state's requirements? I can take this one. Sure. Um, so the next steps really focus on adopting uh, re revisions to our planning code and other municipal code requirements to ensure that the programs that we've identified in our housing element can be realized and enacted. Um, and then while we're doing that, we need to do that by a certain time frame, the end of January in 2024. Um, and so to make sure that this program is comprehensive. We're also working with our marketing and lobbying teams to um, make sure that we're having the best dialogue possible that we can have with the state um, and providing clear responses to what their requirements are. George, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, sure. Just that, you know, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, the, the town has a set number of units that we have to develop or that we have to plan for within the next eight years. And ADUs, accessory dwelling units, is, is a major component of that. I think within the housing element, there's about 280 that are that we're, we're saying could be developed over the next eight years. They haven't been developed yet, but the plan is that they will get developed as new homes are remodeled and people add ADUs. So while, we, while we're projecting we're going to meet those numbers out there, they're still very important for people to develop an ADU, rent that ADU at an affordable rate, and let the town know that that's actually happening because we're required to report to HCD each, each year that we're meeting our numbers and obligations. Um, we have one here. How does registering an ADU help if Atherton has already met unit requirements? And I think that's for you, Brittany. Sure, and this actually touches on what George was just discuss, uh, describing relative to the annual reporting requirements that we have to HCD. So the housing element is the plan. The annual reporting requirements shows HCD how we're doing in meeting that plan. And while it's easy to say, hey, we have so many ADUs that we think are being limited or we think that are being offered at specific income levels, it's very helpful to have residents acknowledge that that's the income level or what the income levels are that they are renting their ADUs at. So we have some, some level of documentation that we can hand over to the state to say, look, no, we have public testimony that these are the rents that they've been given. Thank you. Um, this is the Brittany show. Sorry, Brittany, this, all these questions are probably for you. That's why um, I have my team of experts in the background. I'm, now. I'm glad. Um, so the next one comes from Tom. Uh, is the town considering adding multifamily sites to the housing element that will not meet the AFFH requirements? 
No, because inherently just by having a multifamily housing typology, that's what HCD is looking at when they're requiring us to provide multifamily. They're saying Atherton has historically been a single family residential typology. <clears throat> we have uh, institutional uses that are related to um, schools and town infrastructure. Uh, but we really don't have any multifamily housing that's open to the general public outside of that. And HCD sees that as addressing AFFH because it's it's access for, for somebody who otherwise couldn't live here. Um, and even if it's a market rate, uh, it's even if it's a market rate apartment or condo in a multifamily building, that's still a different unit type than your standard single family home that you have in Atherton. I think somewhat related is, is this question, how is the town insured affordable housing in our boundaries? Um, so we've talked about the ADU program and that's really how we're meeting the number requirement for the housing element and the RENA allocation. Uh, another component of this in the housing or another component of affordable housing that the housing element is asking for is that the town consider an inclusionary housing policy. So for multifamily development, a portion of that would be required to be affordable housing units. Uh, that's yet to go forward to the city council yet. That's still under analysis um, by staff. So at some point we would come before the city council and ask them what percentage of units should the inclusionary housing program require be affordable and then more specifically what level of affordability should that be um, and those are future discussions that we plan on happening with the community okay um and the question came in from david that kind of relates to that as well is how do you reconcile the cost of the land and development with the compliance of their affordable housing requirements. So that's something that we're hoping will be identified partially in the inclusion, the inclusionary housing study, at least so if, insofar as what's the right percentage number that should be required. Um, a standard percentage is usually 20%. So in order to make it more feasible, should it drop down to 10%? Does it need to go up higher? Um, or if it does go up higher, does that preclude, um, does that make development less feasible? Uh, these are a lot of the levers that we'll be looking at when we look at that program. This might lead into that also. Um for you, or if you want to pass this along to George or Jeff, what is, to give you a break, what is the sure. role of the objective design standards? Jeff, do you want to take this one? Sure. Thanks, Brittany. Just to uh, mix it up. Yeah, Jeff Bradley, uh, planning consultant, working for under contract with the town. Um, objective design standards are important uh, in order to comply with the dozens of, of state laws that, that Jennifer mentioned uh, that have been passed over the last five or six years. And a lot of them essentially require cities approve housing on what's known as a ministerial process, as opposed to a discretionary process, which most of our cities in the Bay Area have used historically. And a, a good example of that is a lot of uh, cities used to say, well, uh, your housing needs to be compatible with the neighborhood. And everyone would argue about what that means. Everyone would have a different opinion and it would take, you know, several months or several years to, to work that out. Under a, under these new objective development standards, uh, through a ministerial process, it means that anyone looking at the requirements, uh, any two different two different people looking at the requirements we would really have no basis for disagreeing on whether the proposal complied with it or not. And a classic example would be uh, building setbacks. Does it meet the building setbacks? Yes or no? And it's very, very black and white. And so cities are now going through the exercise of developing very detailed objective de development design standards 
for residential development uh, to come comply with this this new way of doing business that that the state has handed down. Okay, uh, another question from David in relation to that, that the compliance and maintaining the existing character of the town seems very difficult. To date, the proposed housing sites have nearly all received objections. Where do we sit relative to submitting a plan that will be accepted by HCD? And I'm guessing that's for George or Brittany. Um, can you read me the question one more time? I just want to make sure I fully grasp it. Um, um, balancing the compliance and maintaining the character. Um, basically, bottom line is where is the town relative to submitting a plan that they believe would be accepted by HCD? Sure. So right now we're taking the approach. Uh, we're looking at a number of sites through CEQA. Um, it's likely that we don't need all of them. Uh, we don't know what that sweet number is, but at least we have a selection to choose from. Um, and because there's no set number, because we're solving for inclusive multifamily, um, and we've already met the, the RENA number, there's more comfort in getting HCD acceptance here. Um, but there is a struggle in terms of maintaining the town's character. And I think that largely touches on why the objective design standard conversation is so important, because we really are trying to work with that kind of narrow area of what remains of local control in this sense to really facilitate um, something that the town can recognize as as Atherton um, and doesn't seem like such a, a drastic departure from what has been the history of the development pattern for the last 50, 70 years. Got it. Okay, this one, we're gonna skip around and, and have go to George, a question from Adam. Is there any discussion to provide the affordable housing to those who support the community, such as teachers, firefighters, police, healthcare, et cetera? Sure, if, if I recall, and Andreas, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there was uh, a, a legal opinion that the council got probably about a year or so ago when we were still talking about the housing element and compliance and submitting something to the state that um, affordable housing opportunities that are just open to the general public are income-based but can't be restricted income source-based. So in other words, we, we can't um, specifically say, okay, that affordable housing site can only be for teachers or that one can only be for um, firefighters or police or something, it's income-based. Uh, if it is a development that occurs on a school site, they have the ability to restrict their own sources, but the town can't do that. Is that correct? That, that, that's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, next one is from Tom, and I guess this would probably go to Brittany again. Uh, what properties owned by the town are currently included in the housing element as multifamily sites? It's actually this a two or three part question. So I can give you, I'll give it to you all and then I can repeat it for you. So okay. what properties owned by the town are currently in the housing element as multifamily sites? The second part is what additional town owned sites will the town consider to include in the housing element? And all, oh, it's, that's it, it's two questions. Okay, um, so in the adopt, you wanna take that one, George? Go okay. for it. Part of it, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to you because this was probably before your time, but the council did, well, the town only owns two pieces of property. One is where the city hall and library sits and the, and the corporation yard right near it, the city hall civic uh, plaza area. And the second is Holbrook Palmer Park. So the, the in the early on portions of the housing element discussion, the council discussed, hey, if we're going to put housing somewhere, we're putting it on private property, we also need to consider town property as well. So they did evaluate putting affordable housing onto the corporation yard that sits at the city hall area. 
Uh, when they drilled down on the corporation yard, however, they realized, oh my gosh, there, and we knew this, there's a 36 inch SFPUC water line that goes all the way across the town center site and right through that corporation yard. So we can't build on top of it because it's got a 25 foot easement that requires it to be open for access up above it. <clears throat> and then it's also right next to the railroad tracks. So that has a significant setback from it as well. So it ended up that that corporation yard building is legal non-conforming. But if we were to ever add something new to it, it would have to be legally put in there. And we only have about 20 to 25 feet in width that we actually have free to build housing. That was challenge number one. Challenge number two was we need somewhere to move that corporation yard where big heavy trucks and equipment come out of it on a daily basis and it's heavily used in the winter season. So all of that would need to be moved somewhere else. And the only other location of property that the town owns in town is Homer Palmer Park. So we would end up having big trucks and big truck traffic moving through the park to the park corporation yard. And they didn't like that solution as well, given the activities that go on in the park. So they, they kind of nixed that civic court corporation yard issue. The, then they evaluated Homer Palmer Park. And they, they, they talked about the deed restriction at Hobart Palmer Park that says if we do something that is beyond uh, resident uh, beyond uh, park and open space use, it needs to only be incidental to park use. So that was a restriction in the deed. And if the town violated that, there was the opportunity that the park would then, in its um, executive interest, it would go back to Stanford. Uh, and Stanford would take control of the whole park, something the town doesn't want because we would lose it. So we are talking to Stanford about that particular issue at present, and we did include um, Hobart Palmer Park, at least the Gilmore House area, that frontage home where the police chief lives right there in the, in the front of the Gilmore House, in front of the park, as an opportunity site uh, that could be evaluated for multifamily housing. So the town is including part of its property, at least in the sequel evaluation process, as a future housing opportunity site. And Brittany, did I miss anything? I would just stress that when we were discussing additional sites this summer, that it was very important to the council to look back at city owned property. Um, and that that's really, you know, why we're taking a look at Holbrook Palmer Park, because they have impressed upon the desire to staff for us to be creative and being resourceful with the town's property. So I, I do want to kind of put it out there that the, the council has has really looked at that as an option. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions, which um, probably go to George. Uh, basically, I think I know the answer to this, but for the audience here, what happens if you just don't, if you never comply with HCD's requirements? What happens to the town if you don't meet the state standards? Well, I'll kick it off, but uh, I'll let Andreas back me up here. Uh, that's, I don't think that's a path the town wants to go down. The, the council has been very clear that we are working toward compliance, but if we don't comply, uh, there have already been you know, some litigation activity uh, in Southern California, those jurisdictions are ahead of us by about two years or so with their compliance requirement dates. So uh, a community like Coronado, a community like um, San Bernardino, both of which have had legal settlements with HCD, uh, they've, they've dragged their feet, they haven't moved toward compliance or they flat out said they're not going to comply, adopted something in their housing element that's not compliant at all. Uh, the states come down to them and said, hey, you you are required to comply. And if you don't, here's the, the remedy. Uh, and in those settlement agreements, uh, the, the state has said, if you don't comply by X date, you will lose your local land use zoning authority uh, to approve certain types of development. And if you don't comply by this next date, you're going to lose all local land use approval authority, which means they won't be able to approve a single single family home until they've adopted a compliant housing element. And it also means that they're subject to builder's remedy solutions. Anybody comes in, buys a piece of land, they can build whatever they want, so long as it complies with the standards for builder's remedy, which means it's part affordable, but it can also be part affordable and multi-use. 
Uh, so there's there's all kinds of um, land use penalties that could be imposed by the state and by the by the by developers. Not to mention the fact that there's also uh, fiscal penalties, uh, financial penalties that could be imposed by the state. Andreas, what I missed? I just really have one thing to add, and that's not that it would shut down land use authority and the ability to move projects forward, but it could potentially hand over control over approval authority to HCD. And so rather than town staff and the planning commission and town council driving development, it could eventually actually get handed over to HCD to make all those decisions. And so that's that would be giving up even more control. It wouldn't just put a pause on all of that, but it would essentially just totally relinquish authority. Right. But right. otherwise, I think you covered it quite well. I'm guessing that means permits would not get approved any quicker, right? <laughs> yeah. So, they may, they may not. We really don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, one of the follow-up questions to get more into, and this is for Brittany, about the design standards for multifamily sites. The question is, when will those be uh, decided on? Is it, will they be voted on at one time or is it a basket of choices that will be voted on all at once? I'm not sure I understand. So I read that question too. And I think when they're asking about the basket of choices, they're asking, are we gonna vote on, or would council vote on the inclusionary housing program, the objective design standards, any any other related uh, code updates as well as a, a revised housing element all at once. And based on this January 31st, 2024 deadline, it's probably going to end up looking like that. We are we are trying to do as much outreach on the, the objective design standards right now up front because they're ready to be talked about. Um, and we're moving forward with all of those pieces as they become available. Um, but we are up against the deadline that we are trying to hit to make, um, to be compliant with the state. Um, and so I do think that it's likely that in January, we're going to see all of these coming to a head at the same time. Um, with that said, we are trying to tackle them as independently as possible so we can give public the space to think about one thing at a time and get focused feedback. Great, thank you. Uh, another one, it was a follow-up. I know you talked about the town-owned sites, but the, there was a follow-up if there are any listed on the housing element for multifamily housing. Yeah, so I saw that question pop up too. Um, for clarification, the adopted housing element that was, so it was adopted last January, but it wasn't certified by the state, uh, that did not have any town owned properties on it. Uh, so we are looking at additional properties to add. Those are currently under review for the uh, for analysis under the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. And one of those sites that was, as we previously discussed, is Holbrook Palmer Park or a portion of it. Um, I'm blinking on the name of the house. Um, Good morning, house. Thank you. Um, so that specific location is something that's going to come up for consideration by the council at some point to include or not to include in the revised housing element. You, you led right into another question that came in about the Gilmore House. What happens if it stays on the list and Stanford later challenges the deed? The follow-up is, wouldn't we be trapped and lose the park? So, uh, good question. Uh, the, the, the Gilmore House is town, town property. So, if it's, if it's in our housing element as an opportunity site, the the expectation is that sometime within the next eight years we would develop that site doesn't mean it has to be developed but it, it, the expectation is that we would do that we are in conversation with stanford uh, and we're trying to uh, winnow down any objection possibility there uh, i don't know if that'll actually happen but if if they maintain their interest uh, then it's unlikely that that site would be developed over the next eight years. At some point, uh, 
over the next few years, probably beyond the eight, their interest ends. Uh, and at that point, the town is free to do what it wants with that site. Right. The only one other question I see here, um, unless other people are still putting in some questions right now, is one that I think has been answered somewhat, but maybe they just wanted a little more clarification about AFFH. Um, and this is for you, George. Why is the town pursuing an inclusive housing ordinance? So an inclusionary housing ordinance that we looked was looked at by the council in one of its first iterations of the housing element that went to the state back in January 2023. And the reason the council adopted the uh, inclusionary ordinance with a 20% requirement for affordable housing is at the time we did not have any uh, opportunity sites beyond 23 Oakwood uh, as multifamily that could be available to the public. So the council felt that with the inclusionary ordinance, we would end up requiring 23 Oakwood as it developed to produce 20% of those units at an affordable rate. And if there were any other uh, multifamily opportunities that did occur, the ordinance would also require them to produce 20% of those units at an affordable rate. The alternative to that 20% production is that they would pay uh, an inclusionary housing fee, and that fee would go into a fund that the town could then use to further uh, development, free, free grants or development opportunities uh, to other uh, opportunities in town to develop affordable housing. So that's one of the reasons the town adopted the ordinance. It, as Brittany indicated earlier, it doesn't mean that they ultimately will keep that ordinance moving forward. They still have that opportunity to not adopt it, or they have the opportunity to reduce the 20% requirement down to 15 or, or something else, or, or even higher than 20. But it hasn't been uh, put forth before the council as a formal ordinance yet. Uh, they'll probably see that as Brittany indicated, probably sometime in January uh, or so when it all comes together, if we actually meet that deadline. I have one last question coming in here right now. Let me just double check. Who is discussing with Stanford the questions about Holbrook, Holbrook Palmer Park and Gilmore House, and is this ha happening right now? Well, that the conversation initially started with me. The council directed me to reach out to representatives of Stanford to determine what their uh, awareness was. Number one uh, of the Gilmore House and the and the park uh, and the deed restriction, and then if we could set up uh, an internal staff meeting, our staff to their staff. Uh, which we're working on doing. That meeting has not occurred yet. Stanford's been a little slow uh, at getting back to us. Uh, and it is at this point, it's two members of the city council, a subcommittee, uh, an ad hoc subcommittee set up by the mayor, myself, uh, planning staff, uh, and the city attorney, if and when needed, uh, to engage in those conversations. But again, they haven't actually happened yet uh, because Stanford has been slow to come to the table. Got it. Well, thank you. I think some of our panelists got off a little easier than others with some of the questions here, but um, I appreciate all of you participating. I I don't see any questions. If some come in as I'm wrapping up, I will bring them to your attention because we do have a couple more minutes here. But just as a reminder, uh, there was an opportunity to submit your questions ahead of time, which thank you for doing that, um, many of you. Um, and as I mentioned, if other questions come in, please submit those either the website via our chat here tonight. We will be posting a recording of this video on the website, and we'll also be addressing any other questions that did not get addressed tonight, although we, I think we did handle all the questions that came in. Uh, if anything comes in afterwards, we can post that on the website. So if there aren't any more, we can go to the next slide. So we offer up um, steps on how to stay in touch. So as I mentioned the website several times, uh, you can also use the QR code. If you don't wanna type in all those letters, you can just uh, go directly to the website there. And then Brittany, our popular panelist here, her email is listed. And then of course the social media channels for the town at Instagram, X and Facebook are all included here for your convenience. We appreciate all of your participation. Um, and encourage you to continue um, giving your input, 
to the housing element as it's a very important component to the town's character and future. Um, and we wanna make sure that you're a part of it. So thank you all for participating. Have a great night.